Um, we just finished the third meditation. There is a very interesting thing that follows from the third meditation. So the thing to rem this summary is actually really nice in that it brings up two things. The purpose is to try to establish this general, this ability to think about general ideas in a clear and distinct way. And furthermore, we prove that God exists on the basis of clear and distinct thinking. This has created what is commonly called the problem of the Cartesian circle. And if you're looking for something to do research on for your papers, you will find a ton of articles published in the past <coughs> five years, probably the past two years, you could find a mess of them, that are just on trying to understand this problem. What is going on with the Cartesian circle? This, the problem is in the third meditation, it seems like Descartes introduces circular reasoning. So here's the circle. On the one hand, God is needed to ensure that clear and distinct ideas are true. If I don't have God in place, I can't be sure that 2 plus 3 equals 5 and any other clear and distinct ideas. But how do I prove that there is a God? Well, because I relied upon clear and distinct ideas. Uh-oh. So if you need God to establish the, the general reliability of clear and distinct ideas, so you prove that God exists, and what's the way in which you prove God exists? On clear and distinct ideas, it seems like you've got a problem of circularity here. That you're assuming either, if, you are, if you're using clear and distinct ideas to establish God exists, then you must think they're generally true. But we are trying to prove God exists in order to show that they are generally true. So many people think that Descartes has really stepped in it here. That he has introduced this problem that you can't take back. That once you say that I, my, I can't trust my mind until I prove there's a God, here's one way this is often taken. I can't trust my mind until I prove that God made it. But how do I prove there's a God? By using my mind. Well, you can't do that. So that goes against his original statement of I think, therefore I am, because in order for him to be uh, reality, God would have to be reality as well. But he did he did it the opposite way. Here, Found himself as reality and then tried to go for finding God as reality. Here's one way I might suggest actually Descartes isn't in such bad trouble. So, because you're, you're, you point out, like, then what was the point of the second meditation? How come he said that we could know certain things then? What he's doing in the second meditation is showing particular clear and distinct ideas are true. What he's dealing with in the third meditation is the general reliability of all clear and distinct ideas. Maybe, so here's my thought, maybe he hasn't stepped in it so bad. Maybe this is only an apparent problem. What he's trying to do is prove the generality of clear and distinct thinking to be correct. And then he establishes the existence of God by appealing to particular or specific clear and distinct ideas. Maybe Descartes isn't actually caught in a circle. He's using specific claims to prove the general, as opposed to saying that he's relying on the same kinds of things here. And so the, the I think, I am, I exist, those are all particular claims. If you're interested in some articles that explore that idea for your paper, I'd be happy to point you in that direction. Um, and that, I believe, is the end of our slides for the third meditation. This takes us to a new slideshow for the fourth meditation. The fourth meditation naturally follows from the third. So the, ignoring some of the problems we just raised for the third meditation, the question arises, I mean, it's sort of like, hey, I fixed the fact that, I might, that my mind could have false beliefs in it because God is the author of my mind. Um, so this is this bullet point I have under medi on meditation three. Right? Since there is a God, I can conclude that I can trust the operations of my mind because it's been put together by a perfect being. Well, the fourth meditation actually then considers the opposite problem. Well, if God created my mind, which I needed to establish, 
then how can it, my mind be imperfect? And how can it produce any false beliefs? I mean, it's almost like he went from one extreme to the other, right? He went from saying, how can I believe anything at all to be true because I don't know the author of my being? Then he says, I know the author of my being. It's a supremely perfect being. And now you have to say, holy crap, how could a supremely perfect being make me such that I'm capable of having false beliefs? How could a perfect being create me that is riddled with error? And that's what we're doing in the fourth meditation. Um, what we're going to do is break into some groups and uh, talk about some specific things in the fourth meditation. Questions? Um, so, let me ask, so here's the, one of the easy questions. Uh, what are the two faculties Descartes believes are responsible for, for creating these falsehoods or for him acquiring falsehoods? What are the two faculties? Go for it. He said it's his faculty of knowing and his faculty of choosing. Yeah, the faculty of knowing, and he sometimes calls this different names, but faculty of intellect. It's that thing that we rely upon that tells us things are true or false. It's you know, Remember way back to Discourse on Method a couple weeks ago when he says good reason is the most you know well-distributed thing in the world? That's what he's talking about. The thing that lets you know some things are true and some things are false. That thing that tells you, when you think I am, I exist, and you go, that's got to be true. That's the intellect. That's this faculty of reason, of knowing or understanding. The other one is the faculty of choosing, which is just, in Descartes' view, free will. Your ability to make free choices. Um, so the second question is, how are, <coughs> what do you say about the extent of these two um, things? The extent of the will compared to the ability to understand. Um, how do those compare to one another? Given yeah. that the extent of his free will is definitely like sufficient enough, and he's basically like not going to complain about it. In what way? So the so how does he say that it's limited? Is it unlimited? What what, what does he say about the will? Yeah, it's, it's limited to his choice that he can make. Although, I mean, what what are the range of choices that he can make? Exactly, it's, it's limited to the subject that he's making choices about. Did you say it is? Um, did you say it is limited or it is unlimited? I'm it's limited to the number of choices that you could make. Like if you could make a hundred choices, you know, you know. he is going to actually argue or states in here that it is it is virtually unlimited. That it's the one thing that we have that makes us the most like God, which is incredible if you think about this. So I mean, when he thinks about making a choice, it's not sometimes it's in a weird way in that. In a sense, Descartes thinks you could choose to be a bird. But if you choose, if, of course, if you make the choice, you would fail at that, because you can't fly. But that doesn't stop you from making that choice. Um, Descartes thinks that we have the unfettered ability to choose anything whatsoever. So our will is unlimited, but our understanding, is it unlimited or is it limited? It's limited. It has a finite reach. We don't know everything. There's something we can't understand, we can't process. So here's the setup for how he wants to deal with this problem. We've got unlimited free will. We've got limited intellect or understanding. So based on this paragraph, what is he? what are some of the different things you came up with that explain how we make errors? When, when do we fall into making errors? Mm -hmm. We make errors because, um, <coughs> like, what we understand, what we know, is we see that as a truth, but there's other things that we don't know, so that can form an error. So, our intellect sometimes tells us these things are true, these things are false, but since it's limited, there are other things the that the intellect has no ruling on. It doesn't tell you it is true or false. So, for instance, right now, if you were thinking, I exist, the intellect informs you that is true. It has to be true. It couldn't, you can't have that thought and it be false. So when you affirm that, when you choose to affirm that, you're just following what your intellect has told you. But what if you, right now, like what if you hear a car alarm going off outside and you form the belief or you choose to believe someone's stealing a car? 
Descartes would say, whoa, 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 you've just done something you're not allowed to do, so to speak. That you are having, you are choosing to believe things that your intellect did not tell you are must be true. If you hear a car alarm outside, that could be a number of different things. It doesn't mean someone's stealing a car. It could mean a cat or a squirrel jumped on a car. It could mean somebody forgot to turn off their alarm before they pulled their door handle. It could mean that, you know, sometimes if the wet, if the wind blows really strongly, that, you know, it hit, made the alarm go off. There's a number of different causes that could have brought about the car alarm going off. We fall into error, as he says, because our will is greater than our understanding. If we just stay, if we just willed those things that are within the limits of our understanding, we'd never make a mistake. The, the problem is that we overstep what we are entitled to say in beliefs. That when we start going from the things that are certain and clear and distinct, and then we no longer stay within those bounds, but we start making judgments about things that are not clear and distinct, that are not certain. So he thinks um, the problem is that, maybe not the problem, but the reason why we make errors is because we foolishly, it is our fault for using, for extending our choices beyond what our understanding lets us say. Does that make sense? Anybody, do I need to, would you like another illustration of this? Anybody come up with something different here? Did anybody get to number four? I was just curious. All right, a few groups did. I just looked at it real quick. What are your thoughts on number four? Um, I thought that he wasn't really blaming God, but rather thanking him for not only having intellect, but also having the increased capacity to have in this world to make errors. And he argues that having this will is better than not having this will because it, allows, it gives him more capabilities. So he doesn't want to blame God because, for one, his <coughs> understanding is good and his will is good. So why should God take the fall for this? You know, God's been good in creating him this way. Um, yeah? I think we also, to go off of that, we also said that, um, if you're reading, we read through the paragraph, uh, he states that it's not God's fault that he doesn't use his freedom well, that he makes judgments about things that he does not properly understand. Yeah, so the fault is on Descartes' end for choosing to make these judgments about things that you don't fully understand. When you make judgments about those things that outstrip what your intellect tells you are true. Good. That's a good answer. <laughs> so, here's how Descartes does the fourth meditation. God is good because he created me with a good intellect. This intellect does accurately and reliably tell me what is true and what is false. The only thing that you could say is that, that is weak about my intellect is it doesn't tell me everything. It, uh, it, it's limited in the scope of things that it can inform me about the truth or falsehood of it. But he says that, I mean, why should I hold, why should I be mad at God about that? I mean, is God obligated to make me omniscient? I don't think so. So it's okay that God made me with a good but limited uh, intellect. And furthermore, God gave me this free will, and the free will God gave me is like the greatest thing on earth. I mean, it's the greatest faculty I possess. And for that reason, I can't blame God. So God gets off the hook because God has given Descartes good intellect, good will, and Descartes is to blame because it is through the misuse of free will that um, that he falls into error. It's not that God makes him fall into error. Descartes chooses things that leads him to error. Yeah? So, basically, free will limits our intellect. Uh, maybe a better way to put it is that free will over... And I would almost say the other way. Free will steps beyond what our intellect allows us to do. Okay. So the intellect is trying to say, only believe these few number of things, but we foolishly say, no, I want to believe more things than what my intellect says are true. That's the way Descartes wants you to understand. This is kind of like the problem of evil. Um, he never directly takes on the problem of evil here, but he's, uh, I think that he would say similar things about that free will has, is the cause of that. Um, any so this is what we're doing for Meditation 4. Were there any other questions, comments, ideas, things that came up in this reading? 
that you would like to talk about or questions you had that I'd like that you'd like me to try to answer. All right, go ahead and if you'd like to go back to your seats, um, let's go ahead and go back to our original seats. Make sure you have access to your notes and you're uh, comfortable and back to doing our usual classroom thing. Yeah, I'm going to take these up. If you want to turn them in now, I'll take them. If you want to give it to me after class, I'll take it then. I don't need the question, just the answer. As we move into the fifth meditation now, the fifth meditation was hopefully, I mean, it's not easy to understand, none of the readings are, of course, but it's a lot shorter, which maybe was a breath of fresh air. There are, the, there's really one main topic of the fifth meditation. And the main topic is what... I'll be referring to as our knowledge of essences, the essence of things. This comes, hopefully connects up with what I was saying about the wax. That Descartes thinks that we, are, we have innate knowledge of the essences of all sorts of things. And then he's going to explore sort of a second argument for the existence of God based on this newfound understanding of essences. So, on page 58, he says... Um, so this is, I mean, when you're going through the meditations, one of the things that you're probably often thinking about is why don't we get to knowledge of physical objects? I'm sick of all this inward meditating, my own thoughts, the existence of God. When do I get to things like chairs and tables and other people? When do I get to those beliefs? They're coming in meditation six. Before we get there, though, Descartes says, um, before inquiring whether any such things exist outside of me, I surely ought to consider the ideas of these things insofar as they exist in my thought and see which ones are distinct and which ones are confused. So what he's thinking of is I have the idea of a book and of a table, of another person, of a tree, and so on. What is it about these ideas? I, before I start asking whether anything corresponds in the external world to those ideas, let me just see what can I conclude about those ideas themselves. One of the things he's going to be focusing on, it, when he talks about the ideas of things, I mean for, to, for us to use this other word, essence. The idea of something, or at least the idea of things in general, tells us what their essence is. So for Descartes, a material object, what is the essence of being a material thing for Descartes? The essence of a material thing is to be extended. And if you, here's an argument or a way to test essence. <coughs> Can you imagine something of that kind not having that feature? So is it possible for something to be a material thing and not be extended, to have like dimension to it? And it seems like a lot of people have concluded Descartes was right. That I can't imagine, it's not <coughs> possible to imagine matter, something composed of matter, but not having extension to it. It's made of matter, it's got to have some kind of extended quality about it. Let's see what else we can think about that have uh, other essential truths that we can arrive at. Um, another key part to this is also going to be thinking that essences for Descartes are innate knowledge. That we know what essences are, not because we learn them through experience, but that your mind was already stocked up with all these things at birth. Who stocked them up? Thank goodness God did. God is, once again, responsible for this aspect of us. He, he says that essences are, what he, what he says, are real. They're not imagined. They're not fabricated. They are real things. Why? Because they have their own, what he calls, true and immutable natures. To be immutable is to be unchanging to not be subject to change. 
He uses the example of a triangle. He thinks when you reflect on the concept you have of a triangle, you have to think of a, of a two-dimensional geometrical figure where the interior angles, if you added them up, had all add up to 180 degrees, or two right angles. Um, it has to be a three-sided enclosed figure. Now, you didn't come to that idea by studying triangles. It's not like you go, okay, here's one triangle. It happens to have three sides. It happens to have three angles. It happens to have all interior angles that add up to 180 degrees. Okay. Here's a second triangle. It also, whoa, it also has three sides. It also has three angles. And all of its interior angles also add up to two right angles. Amazing. What a coincidence. And even a third one. You don't keep doing this. It's not like after a while you go, I bet they all are like that. You know that all triangles are like this without having to study all of them. How are we able to do that? He thinks that the reason why is because that knowledge is innate. If it wasn't innate in us, then we might be sitting here wondering, I know these ones are all like that, but how do I know they all are like that? How do I know there isn't some kind of triangle that no one has yet discovered where the two, where all the interior angles add up to like 190 degrees? How do I know that they, it must be 180 degrees? You know that, he says, because it's innate within you. And furthermore, you didn't create these ideas. It's, otherwise, you, you would be free to say, in my idea of a triangle, the interior angles only add up to 90 degrees. You're not at liberty to do that. You cannot make triangles whatever you want them to be. They have a certain nature and that nature is independent of the way you want them to be. And what's true of triangles is true of all concepts, he thinks. That the nature of what a book is, or the nature of what a circle is, the nature of what a person is, the nature of what um, you know, a dog or a cat or you know, cheesecake, all of these things have a certain nature. And you are not at liberty to make them what they are. They are that way, and you make them. Uh, you don't make them that way. You recognize that it must be that way. That their essential nature is just what makes them, is what ties them all together, what they all have in common. And this is, like I said with the wax, this comes back to how is it that you're able to recognize what wax is when it's hot and when it's cold? Because your mind recognizes that essential nature that is common to all of it. One of the passages that he has in here um, on 58, when he talks about it, it's on the right column in the middle, um, in that second full paragraph. You don't, if you want to look and find it, you can. But this is, a, this is like a playbook straight out of Plato's philosophy. He says, he's talking about these essences, and he says, their truth is so open and so much in accord with my nature that when I first discover them, it seems I am not so much learning something new as recalling something I knew beforehand. In other words, it seems as though I am noticing things for the first time that were in fact in me for a long while, although I had not previously directed my mental gaze upon them. If you, Some of you may have read some Plato in your Introduction to Philosophy classes. This is direct... This is Plato, right here. Plato, if you read some of the Republic, or if you read a dialogue called Mino, and maybe some of the other ones, um, you would see Plato saying, the way that we come to knowledge is not really by learning anything new, but by remembering things that we had in our minds from birth. This is essentially what, what Descartes is also saying here. When I look at a triangle and I come to realize that the interior angles always add up to 180 degrees, it's not that I have the feeling like I learned something new as much as it's like I'm recalling something that's been within me forever. 
And maybe, some people agree with this, some people don't, maybe you get that same feeling when you do, there's a different way in which you learn math versus how you learn science. When you get math, like when you learn basic algebra or geometry, there's a certain kind of like aha to recognizing how to do those things that's different than like when you learn the double helix structure of DNA. I mean, the double helix structure of DNA is cool, but you don't sit there and go, oh, aha, that's what it is. That's how it has to be. Whereas when you learn about the interior angles of triangles or the properties of parallel lines or um, the properties of um, you know, basic arithmetic and mathematics, you realize this is the way it must be. It couldn't be any other way. This is the way it is. Descartes thinks that that difference is a difference in innate knowledge. That's that, that aha is kind of like you having accessing your innate knowledge. So, he gives kind of a brief argument for this. He says, whatever is clearly and distinct of a thing's essence is true of it, and whatever is true is something, so a thing's essence must be something. So he's arguing, once again, the, the, the significance of this is that essences are not things we invent. They are not something that we can change. They are things that we discover. They are things we recognize. So they're not fabricated by us. They're not manufactured by us. We don't vote on them. We don't create them. We acknowledge them. These essences are something that have a reality independent of my nature. And he would say God is the one who established all those essences. God made triangles these way. God made circles the way they are. That God created the general essence of all things. So, when we think about something's essence, we're thinking about what is it that makes it what it is. We're thinking about something that, is, that has to be true of it in order for it to be the kind of thing it is. So if you think about the essence of a triangle, you're thinking of a three-sided, at least a three-sided figure. When you think about the essence of a circle, you're thinking of a set of points that are equidistant from a center point. If you think about the essence of being a bachelor, you're thinking about a man that is unmarried, and maybe some other qualities. That these are things that essentially make those things what they are. You cannot be a triangle and have more than three sides. You cannot be a circle and have points that are not equidistant from the center. And you can't be a bachelor if you're married or if you're a woman. That's because the essence of these concepts necessitate that if you're that kind of thing, you have those kinds of features. Now, God is an interesting subject to think about. What is God's essence? Descartes says that God's essence is of a supremely perfect being. Supreme perfection, however, has to include existence. Why? I mean, you might think of it like this. If something didn't exist, it would be less than perfect. It wouldn't be as good as it could possibly be. If God were... So if you, if you think that God would, could be supremely perfect in every way and not exist, then you're thinking of a less than perfect God. There's a more perfect concept of God. Which one is that? One that is supremely perfect and also exists as well. So in God's case, and in God's case alone... God's essence includes existence. Nothing else is like this, he would stress. There is no other thing that is such that its essence is it, that existence would be included in its essence. Everything else, you can separate their essence and their existence. So like for triangles, we can, we can separate the idea of a triangle from its existing in some physical, material form. Um, for the idea of a dog, we can think about what the essence of doghood is and whether or not anything actually exists that is a dog. 
for unicorns. We can think about the essence of what a unicorn is and separate that from whether or not unicorns actually exist. The essence does not include its existence. But for God and for God alone, when you consider God's essence, you have to think about God's existence. Otherwise, you're not fully thinking about God's essence. You're thinking of something less than what is supremely perfect. So now, Descartes, since we are able to think clearly and distinctly about the nature of essences, we have yet a second proof for the existence of God. If you've had an intro to philosophy that covered Anselm's ontological argument, this argument is almost exactly like Anselm's. And for that reason, we'll also carry the same criticisms, which we may not cover today. So this is what we've done in the fifth meditation. We've talked about essences that, those essences that can be clearly and distinctly understood are real things. Essences are discovered by reason. They're discovered, they're not fabricated. And for everything except God, its essence is distinct from its existence. However, the clear and distinct idea of God's essence constitutes sufficient grounds for concluding that God does exist. And that is the fifth meditation in world record time. Are there any questions about meditation five? So the sixth meditation finally brings us to the question. I like this. This is the traditional portrait of Descartes. I like that one. Um, it takes us to the, finally the question of do material objects exist? What can I say? about the knowledge of particular things. And secondly, what can I say about the, the, the second major issue is how the soul is distinct from the body. Um, let's start with the first issue. Descartes begins by trying to get us to think first that the possibility of material objects is, is, is something that could possibly be true. Um, the, this argument is based on separating the way that we are able to have what he calls the faculty of imagination compared to the faculty of pure intellection. Um, and for this, let's look at that last paragraph on page 61, and I'll explain what he's doing here. Um, so, on the right side, here's what he says. To make this clear, I first examine the difference between imagination and pure intellection. So, for example, when I imagine a triangle, I not only understand that it is a figure bounded by three lines, but at the same time I also envis envisage in my mi with my mind's eye those lines as if they were present. And this is what is, I call imagining. On the other hand, if I want to think about a kiliagon, let me pause here and say, what is a kiliagon? Anybody look that up, or anybody know what a kiliagon is? More than ten sides. How many? Is it more than ten sides? A lot more than ten. Yeah, it's a thousand-sided figure. So a geometrical shape and clothes that has a thousand sides to it. If I want to think about a kiliagon, I understand. I certainly understand that it is a figure oh, consisting of a thousand sides just as well as I understand that a triangle is a figure consisting of three sides. Yet, I do not imagine those thousand sides in the same way, or envis envisage them as if they were present. And although in that case, because of force of habit, I always imagine something when I think about a corporeal thing, I may perchance represent to myself some figure in a confused fashion. Nevertheless, this figure is obviously not a kiliagon. For this figure is really no different from the figure I would represent to myself if I were thinking of a myriagon, or a figure with a large number of sides. You know what a myriagon has? 10,000 sides. So, here's what he's getting at. When you think about things, there are two ways to think about them. One is with the imagination, the other is with pure intellection. We, so a triangle illustrates this really well. When you think about, when you imagine a triangle, it's like you are visually picturing it. You think about it the way it is represented. But when you 
Think about a triangle with your thoughts of pure intellection. You're not thinking of the image of the triangle. You're thinking about its essence in this other way. In a way that maybe we could say is propositional, um, but it's not pictorial or it's not sensory. It's that sense in which you understand that tri all triangles have three sides and they all have the internal angle, the internal angles all add up to um, two right angles. That is something that you don't picture but you understand. Um, so the imagination is representational in its content. It could be visual, auditory, it depends on what we're talking about. Or it could be, and then the, the faculty of pure intellection is what I maybe think is maybe propositional in its nature, once again, not pictorial. It's that sense in which, so this is where the Kiliagon is really helpful. You cannot understand, you, or sorry, you cannot picture a Kiliagon in your mind. You can't just come up with it by thinking about it. At least whatever you represent in your mind to be is subject to be incorrect, or what he calls confused, incomplete. But you can understand the nature of a Kiliagon. When I tell you that an Achilleagon is a figure with a thousand sides, none of you say, I don't know what that means, or I can't understand that. You all understand it. You get it. And that's what Descartes pointing out, is that on the one hand, we can picture things. On another hand, we can understand them in this other way. So, um, yeah, so I already did that. So we can use either faculty to think about a triangle, only the faculty of pure intellection can be used to think about kiliagons or myriagons. You can't picture those. But this is the question that ends up arising out of this discussion, which is, why would I have this faculty of imagination? Like, why would God give that to me? Remember, my essence, the, the thing that I can say about the I, is that I am a thinking thing. So whatever it is has to have the faculty of pure intellection. But there's no reason why you had to have sensory experience. You could have just been a thinking thing that entertains the thought, I exist, I am. When you think that thought, you don't represent any image in your mind. You just think that thought. You understand it in this propositional way. So why would God give me this faculty of imagination? Why did he add that on to my nature? It's not something I need to have. It's something in addition to what I need. Well, the most probable reason for adding this faculty to my nature is for the purpose of understanding external material objects. That God would give you this ability to have these sensorial representations of things if there is an external world where having that kind of representation would help you understand and know what it is. I mean, God could have given you a faculty such that it's like radar or something, where you don't in, have any image of the world, but it just like says, you know, table three feet in front of you. you know, table, you know, six feet to the right. That you could, the world could sort of be reported to you that way. Or maybe God thought it was more efficient or better for you to have things reported to you in, in terms of its visual content. That that visual representation is a better way to understand the nature of the world. So since I have this ability to understand that the, I have this ability to think about the world in a visual or a sensory way, that might seem to imply that there is some world for me to know through that means. Now all this shows is probably that's true. We still can't say anything about specific, particular, physical objects. So to do that, we're gonna have to move on. We come back to this faculty, this passive faculty of sensing. This was sort of suggested in Meditation 3. But now that we've got God on the table, this is a little more effective. Um, let's take a look at page 64. <clears throat> and I want to read part of this um, right column here. Um, and on the right column, from the very top, let's just start at the second line. It says, now there certainly is in me a passive faculty of sensing. That is, a faculty for receiving and knowing the ideas of sensible things. But I could not use it unless there also existed either in me or in something else a certain active faculty of producing or bringing about these ideas. But this faculty surely cannot be in me, since it clearly presupposes no act of understanding. 
And these ideas are produced without my cooperation and often even against my will. Therefore, the only alternative is that it is some other substance different from me, containing either formally or eminently all the reality that exists objectively in the ideas produced by that faculty, as I have just noted above. Hence, this substance is either a body, that is, a corporeal nature, which contains formally all that is contained eminently, um, or objectively in the ideas, or else it is God or some other creature more noble than a body, which is which contains eminently all that is contained objectively in the ideas. But look, since God is not a deceiver, it's pat patently obvious that he does not send me these ideas, either by himself or even through the mediation of some creature that contains the objective reality for these ideas, not formally, but em eminently. For since God has given me no faculty whatsoever for making this de determination, but instead has given me a great inclination to believe that these ideas issue from corporeal things, I fail to see how God could be understood not to be a deceiver if these ideas were to issue from a source other than cor corporeal things. And consequently, corporeal things exist. What's he saying here? Can somebody, I mean, I know that was a big chunk and there was a lot of objective, formal, and eminent reality talk there. Um, can anybody, anybody have an idea of kind of what he's getting at here? Something that you could try to say in your own words of how he's trying to say we are justified in thinking there is a world outside of our minds. Doesn't have to be the whole story. If there's just even one thing in this passage that stands out to you as, that you think is part of the story, What do you think, let me focus on this, what do you think he just means? You don't even have to find this in the text if you don't think that makes sense. What do you think he means by there being a passive faculty of sensing? Why did, what, what, is that, what do you think that is about? Mm -hmm. Are you saying that we exist with or without it? So... Think of, it's a little different than that. Uh, um, what does passive suggest to you? What's it opposed to? Yeah, so it's something that we don't, so we don't do it actively. It is something that happens to us. So if we have a passive faculty of sensing, that means that we get sensory information passively, something that we don't, like, try to do. We're not actively conjuring it up. So, like, when you have a daydream or something, if I, if I were to say, close your eyes and imagine you're on a beach with a pink elephant and, you know, Marilyn Monroe, that would be you actively conjuring up an image. That would be you controlling it, you creating it. But right now, most of the sensory information you're taking in right this moment, if you're paying attention to class, is not something you are conjuring up by your will. It's happening to you passively. You're receiving it. Descartes says, that's interesting. God made me so that I am passively receiving these ideas. I don't conjure them up and create them. Furthermore, God made me in such a way that I am strongly inclined to believe these things. That you don't, when you're walking down the hallway, if somebody starts walking right at you, you don't have to sit there and think, wait a minute. There's an image approaching me, and therefore it's likely somebody is coming towards me, and if I don't move, I'm going to get hit. I mean, people who do that don't have a long lifespan. Um, try that with a bus. The God made us such that we are strongly inclined to believe that these images correspond to external bodies. Well, if God's not a deceiver and he's made us this way, well, that's another really good reason to think corporeal things exist. So, in a very loose form, this is kind of the way I put it. God has given me a passive faculty of sensing, which greatly inclines me to believe in corporeal things. Secondly, God is not a deceiver, therefore, corporeal things exist. If God gave us this faculty of sensing things, and these things come in against our will, 
And secondly, they strongly inclined us to believe in the existence of material objects. Wouldn't God be a pretty rotten creator for making us this way and there being no like material world that these ideas correspond to? Since he's established that God is a supremely perfect being and the author of his nature, it has to follow then that if God's not a deceiver and if God made my mind this way, corporeal things must exist. Does that make sense? Are there questions about what, he, what, what I'm trying to get across with this? I know there's a lot of Descartes' wonderful metaphysical language, but I'm trying to boil it down in a simpler to understand way here. Here's the other big theme. Descartes' mind-body dualism. So this is actually moving slightly back, so we're going to the left side on page 64. And I'm going to read that first full paragraph there. First I know that all things that I clearly and distinctly understand can be made by God such as I understand them. In other words, whatever I can conceive to be the case, God can do, right? If you can imagine it, God can get it done. He's omnipotent. For this reason, my ability clearly and distinctly to understand one thing without another suffices to make me certain that one thing is different from the other, since they can be separated from each other, at least by God. The question as to the sort of power that might affect such a separation is not relevant to their being thought to be different. For this reason, from the fact that I know that I exist and that at the same time I judge that obviously nothing else belongs to my nature, or essence, except that I am a thinking thing, I rightly conclude that my essence consists entirely in my being a thinking thing. And although perhaps, or rather as I shall soon say assuredly, I have a body that is very closely joined to me, nevertheless, because on the one hand I have a clear and distinct idea of myself insofar as I am a, merely a thinking thing and not an extended thing, and because on the other hand I have a distinct idea of a body insofar as it is merely an extended thing and not a thinking thing, it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. Here's the argument that he's putting forward here. The first claim is just that God can bring about whatever I can clearly and distinctly understand. And that's once again just that idea that if you can conceive of something, surely God can make it that way. You can imagine a purple dragon living in a land with, you know, candy corn and gumdrops. God could, God has the ability to make that happen. Um, secondly, um, I can clearly and distinctly think that the mind exists without the body and the body exists without the mind. Here, some of us maybe need to really work hard to get this one down. Some people can't do this. But Descartes wants you to think that it's possible that you, you can imagine existing without a body. We tried to do this in the second meditation, where you can imagine that all you are is a center of consciousness. All you are is a thinking thing. And that it's just a, a, an illusion or something that you are having this perception of your body. But there's nothing that says your consciousness has to be tied to a brain, or has to be tied to a body. Um, at the end, I forget which X-Men movie it was, um, but there's that one where um, Professor X is obliterated by Phoenix, and then at the end of the movie, after the credits roll, you know, you hear his thoughts, you know, his, his, his voice, and what, what are they suggesting there? That Professor X continues to exist, not as a, no longer embodied, but he's like a disembodied mind. As far as, nobody I've ever met, when that scene came on, was like, oh, that's incoherent. I can't even imagine that possibility. It, I mean, you might think it's far-fetched, you might not believe it's true, but the possibility is all you need to buy into for Descartes' argument to work. It's possible that there are minds that don't have bodies. It's possible that there are conscious entities that don't have any physical material bodies attached to them. And that's because the essence of mind is to think, 
and the essence of body is to be extended. And Descartes even goes so far in this passage, I think, to say that the essence of mind is to think and not be extended, and the essence of bodies or material things is to be extended and not to think. Another theme of this whole era, we're going to talk a lot about mind and body issues, like consciousness and how it relates to the brain and to the body, is, is it possible for matter to even be conscious? Can matter instantiate consciousness at all? Or is it just completely averse? Like, is matter the kind of thing that cannot possibly be conscious? I mean, if we manipulated enough matter, what could, is it possible to create something that has conscious experiences? that feels emotions and pain and entertains thoughts and ideas just like you and I? Or is the mind of such a nature, this is Descartes' view, that it's just not even possible in principle to create something out of matter that thinks? Because matter's nature is not to think. So, you can clearly and distinctly think the mind exists without the body and the body exists without the mind. Therefore, it's possible, God can bring about that the mind exists without the body, and the body exists without the mind. If God can bring it about, then the mind and body can possibly exist apart. Therefore, it's possible for mind to be one thing and body to be another. And that's really all you have to prove in, in metaphysics. When we, do, when we talk about things in metaphysics, we're looking for necessary truths. So, if mind and body were essentially the same thing, then you shouldn't be able to conceive them as being separate. If the mind is the body, or if the mind is the brain, if they share the same essence, then there would be no possible way for you to think one being separated from the other. So think of... Maybe think of this. This is not an exact analogy, but it'll get us started. Can you think of the number three and think of it as not being an odd number? Is it possible for three not to be odd? The answer should be no. Which means that the essence, what part of three's essence is that it is odd. You can't separate those two things. But now, can you think of Michael Jordan's jersey as not being an odd number? The answer to that should be yes. You might say, wait a minute, his number's 23. How, how can that be odd? Well, you could imagine him having a different number. He could have had number 24. There's nothing about Michael Jordan's number that necessitates that it's an odd number. It could be any number. But with the mind or with consciousness now, it's supposed to be such that you can, you can or I should put it this way, you could not possibly think that consciousness is the same thing as matter. Because if you did think that, then it would be, then you shouldn't be able to think that mind and matter are separate things. But as we saw at the Professor X example, we all can do that. We can all imagine there being a mind that is separate from a body, separate from a brain. Um, for that reason, since they can exist apart, mind and body are not identified with the exact same thing. They are different kinds of things. That, this is, a br well first I should say, this is a brilliant and influential argument. What Descartes is doing here, and also what he's doing with his whole thing with knowledge, sets the agenda for philosophy for the next 500 years. We're still dealing with Descartes' problems today. Because there's a sense in which Descartes seems absolutely right that there are aspects about consciousness and the mind that just are not able to be identified with physical, material things. But on the other hand, once you create this division, it's hard to heal the rift. And you're going to see more of what I mean as we continue to go through the course. This is a, an enduring problem. Um, Here's the model, once again, of what he's doing here. He's supposing that human beings are made out of two complete different substances. There's a, a, a soulish or a mind or a mental substance that um, is an immaterial thing. And the essence of that is to think. 
On the other hand, there is a body, which is a material object. Its essence is to be extended. But they are two distinct things. They are not one and the same thing. You are a composite object. You have both mind and body. And then Descartes has, a, on Descartes' version, the traditional view is that he has causal interaction, that the mind causes things to happen in the body, and the body causes things to happen in the mind. When you will to raise your hand, your mind just, had it some, just made something happen in your body. If you stub your toe on the, on the table, then your body causes you to have an experience in your mind. You feel pain. So Descartes thinks that mind and body are two separate, but causally intertwined entities. And it's especially this question about causation that takes place that is going to be a vexing problem, once again, as a theme throughout much of the rest of this course. There are questions about Descartes' argument, or what his position is. One way to think about this, he would say, you are not your body is not essentially what you are. You could exist without your body, but your mind is what you essentially are. Your mind is what you have to be to be you. Now, there are good things about being mind-body composites, and there are bad things about it. Um, So, um, I'm going to not read this for sake of time, but you can look at this passage in your free time. One of the things he's pointing out here is that the body is set up like a machine, essentially. That God, when he creates our bodies, and this is actually another kind of theme, is that material things are mechanistic. Material things are, don't have, like, minds within them. They're not rational. They're not conscious. They just follow laws of nature. So that when God creates our bodies, he needs to create mechanisms. He needs to create, basically, these, these tools that we can use to interact in the world. So when he creates us, he's got two goals, and he's got to balance these things. There are trade-offs that take place. One is the acquisition of knowledge that um, God wants us to have bodies that enable us to know what the world is like. So he created us with brains and eyeballs and um, ears and noses and, and all those things that inform us about the nature of the world, and that's wonderful. But there's also this other consideration, which is about health and survival, that there's a sense in which God could have made us so that we have understandings of things, but we wouldn't but it wouldn't help us survive. So when we stub our toe, we have like a painful reaction to that. And it, it's good that we have pain. Because if we didn't have pain, we, would in, we, we might continue to do destructive behavior. So God could have made us such that when you hit your toe, instead of feeling pain, you just form the belief, oh, there's tissue damage being done to my toe. But you don't feel any pain. If that was the way we were put together, I mean, you could be being mauled by a lion and you'd be sitting there going, huh, tissue damage all over the place, but not feel any <laughs> excruciating pain over that. If that was true, we probably wouldn't survive very well. Or if you got sick, if you didn't feel certain things or your body didn't have certain reactions to that illness, once again, you'd probably just go through your life and die of that illness. Uh, at least some people would. So it's really important that God balance out both the acquisition of knowledge along with creating certain mechanisms in place that will ensure our health and survival. Um, if you're going to make a lawnmower, you've got to balance two things. You want to make a lawnmower that is able to cut, that is going to be useful in cutting the yard, and you want to make it as big and as efficient as possible. But if you made a lawnmower that was like 12 feet long and 12 feet deep, that's not, as cool as that would be, that's not going to help you mow the lawn. It's going to be dangerous. You won't be able to store it. It's going to be hard to steer. Um, it's better to have a lawn mower that's more like the sizes we get, which are what, like about 3x3 three three or 4x4, four four, because even though it takes you more passes to cut your yard, there are trade-offs in this design. You want, on top of having a big lawn mower to cut the yard, you also need to think of the size in terms of storing it and safety and navigation. In the same way, God is balancing out both 
our acqu the ability of our bodies to help us in acquiring knowledge of the world, but he's got to create them also in a way that they help us survive. And sometimes these two things are kind of in tension with one another. Um, the real downside now um, <laughs> is that um, because uh, we've been created with these things in place, when it comes to our knowledge of particular claims about the external world, we're always prone to error. There is no guarantee in Descartes' epistemology that you, will ev that you could ever say of any particular thing, this is definitely true. There is definitely a book on the desk in front of me. There is definitely another person sitting next to me. All that we have in this regard are probabilities. Now, he would say that we're good when it comes to our knowledge of general claims about the essences of things. Your knowledge of the essence of a book, if it's clear and distinct, you can rely on that. Your knowledge on the essence of human beings or persons, if you've got a clear and distinctive idea about that, you're good. But one thing you can't say ever because of this consideration about the way the body is put together is that some particular claim about a particular external object is definitely true. There's always room for error. But the way he kind of ends all of the meditations, maybe it kind of ends with a whimper for many of you, but he, he thinks that he's done a pretty good job. I've, he's demonstrated that we've got a sure foundation for knowledge, and it comes from these innate ideas that are clear and distinct that must be true. From those ideas, we can come up with, we can prove that there is a God, and if God is perfect and the author of our being, then we can infer from that that the essences that make that are in our mind, these general ideas, have to be accurate. God wouldn't deceive us by creating us with ideas that aren't um, accurate and true representations of things. And then from that, the last step is just to say, our ideas about the external world are very likely to be true. The majority of them are probably true. Because God would be a deceiver if he made us otherwise. However, since he had to build our bodies with this other goal in mind, it's, there's always some room for error. The upside, though, is that God has given us the ability to understand these things. God has made us such that we can realize that we are subject to error, and since we know that we can make errors, we're able to correct for that. We're able to fix that. We don't have to fall into that. So, the whole meditations, very big picture stuff, we can talk about these points. The reason why we began all of this journey was to talk about how do we get rid of false beliefs that are in our um, belief structures? Why do we how, did, how do we root these things out? We root them out using the method of doubt. And the method of doubt, as we, you recall, roughly says only believe those things that are absolutely certain. Don't believe those things that are not certain. Um, secondly, we come across these things that are clear and distinct ideas. These clear and distinct ideas are based on innate ideas. And these things make up the, the most basic foundation that he thinks is that sure foundation for doing science and moving forward with everything else. He establishes the existence of God from those clear and distinct ideas, and that, and that shows that our minds are trustworthy, that we can move beyond particular claims and think about general claims and essences in a way that, it, that will be reliable and trustworthy. And then the final main theme is just what we ended on, which is that the mind and body are distinct things. They are not one and the same thing. They are different kinds of things. And so, uh, the mind and the body um, are two separate substances that causally interact with one another. Um, and that is the sixth meditation. That's really the whole shebang. Um, are there any questions on the sixth meditation, or really about anything that's going on here? Anything, it, as we look at this thing as a whole unit, is there anything that I can fill in or explain or connect dots for you that you're not seeing or that will help you? I can tell you right now the three essays that, you, that I will have up tomorrow. One of them is on Montaigne, and it's going to ask you, um, what are some of his skeptical arguments, and how do those fit in his overall case for this apology for Raymond Seabon? 
So how is skepticism, how does his skepticism fit in with that theme? The second essay that I will list has to do with Descartes' epistemology, this system of beliefs and the method of doubt. And the whole gen I'm going to ask you to give me some kind of general overview about all of the things Descartes claims to establish in the meditation. How does that work? So try to find ways to describe it in the most general and universal way. And secondly, what's your evaluation of that? Do you think he's right? Do you think he's wrong? Does he have some good points? Does he have some weak points? I want you to tell me what you think about that. And the third possible essay is about mind and body. What is his argument that the mind is not the same thing as the body? And how does, um, what, do you, what is your evaluation of this? Do you think he's right about this? Do you think he's wrong? Um, so I'm going to put that back into your court as well. The essays, I should tell you, you do not want to just merely answer what I ask you. These essays, if you want to make an A, these essays are a chance for you to demonstrate all the stuff you've learned in this course up to this point. So I would like for you to use that whole hour, or at least think about using a good portion of that, to write detailed and, um, and essays that show off the stuff you're learning. So don't aim for the bare minimum with these questions as you prepare. Aim to, to show up. Aim to demonstrate all the things you're doing in this class that you're learning. Any questions about any of this stuff? Well then, I will see you next week. If you have any questions, don't forget that I have office hours. We'll see you around.